Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light, peace, and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of the spirit, your living word, that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayer daily. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and I'm excited to bring back podcast regular on The Imagination, certified clinical trauma professional, certified sex offender treatment provider, licensed professional counselor, founder of Survivor Support, podcast host of his own podcast and channel, John Euler LPC on YouTube, father of three, husband to his high school sweetheart, survivor advocate, and someone you all have been heavily requesting to bring back again and again, John Euler. In case you are new here or missed John's briefing on his background on the first episode we did together, here's a short recap of John's many, many accolades and credentials. John's work began over 30 years ago, and the evolution of his career path is nothing short of astounding. His education includes attending Epic Bible College, Biola University, Talbot School of Theology, and California State University in Fullerton. He's worked in both clinical and administrative capacities, outpatient and hospital settings, intensive day treatment settings, residential treatment programs, and in secure facilities, including over 11 years on psychology staff within the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, where he's logged more clinical contact hours within solitary confinement than any other psych staff in the entire U.S., Prior to his work with incarcerated men, he spent years working with sexual abuse survivors and treating severely emotionally disturbed adolescents in group homes and within the largest intensive psychiatric residential treatment facility for troubled youth west of the Mississippi. When John is not providing professional therapy or podcasting, he serves in an advocacy role toward helping increase safety for vulnerable women and minors who are being placed in harm's way by those pushing dangerous ideologies public policies, and legislation. Since John has started being a regular guest on The Imagination, we have been doing a deep dive into the world of therapeutics for survivors, detailing what to expect and look for, as well as ways to take your healing to the next level by becoming conscious of the things that weigh you down and or the ways that you are speaking to yourself. It's been an enlightening journey so far, and I'm excited to keep diving deeper into these topics and more. Today, we will be answering a few of your questions that you guys submitted and continuing the conversation around a therapist's perspective of working with survivors. It's been so refreshing meeting John because unlike many of the therapists you guys hear horror stories about on the show that have turned their back on survivors or who simply didn't do their due diligence to research further than the education their degree afforded them, John went out on a limb and dove into the world of survivors, dissociation, and extreme trauma when he was faced with clients that made him question everything he had learned in an academic setting. It was his open mind towards genuinely wanting to help survivors that opened doors for him to be a hero in his field and a hero in the survivor community. If you've been following along, you know to grab a pen and paper, as episodes with John are guaranteed to be jam-packed with information you'll want to write down and reference later. Before I finish introducing today's guest, I wanted to give just a quick reminder that if you are a survivor or whistleblower who wants to share your story on the podcast or who wants to share any information privately with me, you can email me at imagineabetterworld2020 at gmail.com. I'd also love your support on my Substack, where I'm taking up journaling as an outlet for me personally to reflect on the podcast, guests, and my advocacy work. And you can subscribe to me there at www.emmacatherine.substack.com. All of my social media links are linked in the show notes as well. And I thank you guys all with my whole heart for all the love, support, and safety you provide to this platform and to every guest. So you guys, without further ado, please help me in welcoming today's guest of honor and podcast regular, 
selfless man of God, voice for the voiceless, child abuse and survivor advocate, podcaster and therapeutic warrior, the one, the only, John Euler. John, thank you so much for being here with me again today. Emma, thank you as always for that. Nice. Absolutely. Nice <laughs> I'm really excited to have you back. This has been really, you know, a, a very enlightening journey going on this path with you talking about this. And I know I've told you and even on these episodes, but I'm just so thrilled to meet somebody in your field who's willing to have conversations about these hard topics. And it's been really exciting getting really good feedback about it and just getting private messages from people saying how much this information has been valuable to them and how much it's helped. And so I'm kind of excited that, you know, we're going to spend the first part of this episode answering some questions that people have and hopefully shine some light on that and shine some light on some some issues or maybe some hiccups that people have had in their journey or just some things that they've always wanted to ask a therapist but never had the right one to do it. Um, and for people listening, I encourage you guys, if you have questions while you are watching, go down the comment box. We both read the comments and uh, hopefully plan to do more of these Q&A sessions at the beginning or end of episodes. So feel free to drop your questions down there, you guys. Uh, John will be coming on as a regular from now on uh, for you know as long as he wants to be here. So we will uh, continue down this path together. And I'd love your guys' engagement if you guys have any questions. So I'm going to read the first one, John, and then we can kind of jump into it. And then uh, for the second part of the show, you have an awesome presentation that you just created recently that we're going to do a deep dive into that I also am really excited to, to venture into. And I know it's going to be super valuable for people. So getting into it, I'm just going to read the entire comment to put it into context. So the first one was, last interview with John Euler is one of the best and interesting videos I've watched. I would love to hear the first steps when parts slash alters begin to talk and show things in the inside. And you would think that that's impossible. Can he give some examples how that process begins and what alters come forward to stop? And how can I work with them? And how does he work with them in therapy as a therapist? What can I do to see these flashes longer and remember? What structures of inner worlds are normal? And what are from ritual abuse slash mind control? Can he give any examples? So we'll maybe just start at the beginning and I'll go back to that because there was a few questions in there. Um, so her first question was, first steps when parts begin to talk and show things on the inside and you think that that's impossible. Can you, can you give some examples of how that process begins and how alters come forward to stop and how can he work with them and how can, or how can she work with them and how can you work with them? There you go. And that's, that's going to fit into well, or fit in well into what we're going to be talking about. And most okay. as the chart, because I'm actually going to be showing uh, the overall uh, glimpse into the inner world of a survivor. So we'll be able to actually uh, show in graphic form uh, what that's like. So uh, taking a couple of these pieces, I think she asked, uh, what do you do first when the, when the uh, manifestation is starting? It is probably safe to say that a survivor has been hearing internal dialogue uh, forever, you know, for a long period of time. They've assumed it was their imagination. They've assumed it was self-talk, meaning we hear all these terms. And if you are a survivor and you've experienced this internal dialogue, you're going to assume that's what people mean when they reference self-talk. So, for instance, we have to improve our negative self-talk. Well, a survivor certainly hears negative self-talk is becoming aware of the difference, the qualitative difference between self-talk versus actual parts. And really the difference, practically speaking, again, we defined last time, what's the difference between crazy and non-crazy voices? Essentially, if you're uh, nervous to share with someone that you hear voices, that, may, that means you're not crazy. Okay, so a crazy person doesn't have a problem uh, saying they hear voices. And a crazy person will hear the voices from the outside in as though they are being broadcast to them, either from the mothership overhead or from a, an antenna or from the TV. So they're going to be kind of command or informative uh, kind of messages from the outside in. That's why a crazy person, we use the joke or we use the phrase, that's a joke, a tinfoil hat. 
Okay, why does a crazy person put a tinfoil hat on his head to stop the projection of the the transmission of this information? So the then the, the rays will bounce off, the sound waves will bounce off. So they think so they're protecting their mind. So a, a crazy person doesn't believe they're crazy, doesn't know they're crazy, doesn't is not embarrassed. They know these voices are real, and they're getting special information, and some of which also either tells them they are responsible for preserving people or that people are out to get them. So then you have either grandiosity or paranoid delusions. And so paranoid schizophrenia is usually the kind that will create um, actual death and destruction. So that's why we need to worry about that. The inner voices from trauma will be those that will actually sound separate like voices in your head. So much so that you will find you are, if you're a survivor, you're going to be dialoguing with them. It's literally a conversation that is different than self-talk. Self-talk is sort of a very mild form of your own thoughts. But you'll never find that you're going to dialogue with them. I mean, it, 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 because they're that mild. But internal voices that come from parts or multiplicity, they will actually seem separate and distinct. And as a matter of fact, I've had some clients talk about it. it's almost like they're hearing this dialogue, especially between parts as well. So it's not just one part towards them. You'll have parts that are debating within themselves. And it's almost like they're, they're hearing this and almost like it's flying overhead. So it's very much separate and distinct. And that's where it becomes so powerful because if one part is what's called a per persecutorial part, it's persecuting you, it's really negative and getting down on and commanding certain things, uh, you don't dare disobey it because then it will pick up at that point. It's going to double down on something, and also it can create pain. So that's another piece. So the first thing is to begin to believe or risk believing that this is not your imagination, that this is actually something um, very real on the inside. Now, when we say real, meaning it's not your imagination, it's happening. Nobody else can hear those voices. But to begin to ask yourself a couple of questions, how long have you heard voices? And it will probably be, if someone starts to let them think of themselves think about it, it, it will almost be as though they've always been there. And then there's certain voices that will change. So there's certain voices that you don't mind hearing from and certain voices that you really mind hearing from. And it's not your mother's voice. <laughs> it's separate and distinct. And um, it's almost like you have somebody in your head, so to speak. It's that type of verbalization. So to become aware of the differences, the differentiation in the kinds of voices and realize that, okay, there's, there's probably something here. And now we're going to get into a chart that I've just created for uh, Emma, for our work together here. This is something that I've wanted to put together over time. And I've now put it together. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to make our way through this chart. But what we have here, and I will enlarge it. So if you can't read it, don't worry about it right now. What I want people to see is, and I'm trying to utilize different shapes to indicate different kinds of altars, as it were, or parts. Okay. I've also tried to show the different levels. So what you have here is a pretty good representative sample of somebody that has gone through ritualistic abuse, especially SRA or MKUltra. And each of those will at least uh, um, represent one, but usually you're going to have multiple parts of each of these categories. So I don't even know how many boxes. <laughs> so we could say three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 30, 40, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Okay, that's just 21 alders that really you're going to end up having to work with. And then we have 21, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 36, just at the subconscious. 
And then what did I do? 36, 38, 40. So we have 45. So this person would have 45. That's not all that many. Unless you think, no way, I may have two. Okay. I'm not going to predict you're going to have this many. I, I've never met anybody with less than six, though. So that's part of the process. Your parts or your alters are not going to begin this process with you if this is going to freak you out or if you don't want to know. So kind of one and the same thing. Okay. You're not going to hear from them. Now, it's not wishful thinking, well, this is, sounds psychosomatic, or this sounds like self-fulfilling prophecy that if you want to hear from them, then you're going to hear your own voice. And No, because the question is, have you already been hearing this for a long period of time? Have you been living with those different symptoms for a long period of time? And have you been trying to say, it's not what it really seems like? Okay, so if that seems like the case, then I'm going to help you understand your internal world. Now, everybody's internal world is going to be a little bit different, but this is going to cover kind of the basis, or um, the bases, right? We're going to cover the bases and the basics. And if you have gone through really sadistic stuff, so SRA, or if you've gone through NK Ultra, then these are going to be layered, these different, we're just going to pretend these are each individual parts. They're going to be cloaked then with other things. So part of the challenge will be to get the, the cloak off. Okay, so these are sort of the, the core underlying issues for each of these altars, so you know what you're going to have to deal with. So I wanted you to kind of have a, a, a look at a glance. We'll go from the bottom up just quickly, and then we're going to enlarge this, and we'll work from the, the top down and again, uh, this will just be sort of our intro into this, and we can go more into this later as far as the dynamics. So take a child, a child of age one, age two, could be an infant that has now fallen into the hands of or has a parent. So obviously it's a parent, but somebody is a sadistic sexual abuser, and they start abusing this child. So what you will end up having is for the child, because it becomes too overwhelming, or even a four-year-old or a five-year-old, then a part of them will step in to take the abuse. So the personality is starting to become segmented. So it's almost like, and you can see how we will, I'll need another chart. So we're going to have a working chart next time. But just for the sake of this, let me see if I can do this. So pretend we just had a white sheet of paper, and all we had is the core person on here, there is, we're going to call it ritualistic abuse. That's what the law calls it. As far as a category of abuse, the law actually wouldn't call it, um, right? They wouldn't be charged with ritualistic abuse, but it's a category of abuse, meaning somebody has regular and consistent access to a child, and that person is perping on that child very consistently, and the timing will usually be very consistent. So now it becomes predictable and deviant sexual abusers who are perpetrators and predators, they will always up their game because that's what deviance does. So let's pretend we have a completely blank sheet of paper except for our little person down here, okay? Once the abuse happens, then it's too overwhelming. So we will have what I call the first alder or the primary protector. And you notice it says, and substitute. So what'll happen, let's pretend all, again, we have a total white sheet of paper except for our core person, a little child becoming overwhelmed. So what'll happen for the very first time, this core person goes away and the primary person, I've got this too cluttered. So just know that that's another part now has come to take the place. As a matter of fact, we're going to, we're going to switch places here just for a moment and just for the heck of it. Okay. So we have the person, the child was being abused. I'm going to move our substitute part there. Okay. So the abuse is being directed at our child, at this child. And what happens is, and I used to think that the core part of the little child 
went away. Actually, I think what happens now is this the splitting takes place, and this is a very protective part. So the very first part or altar now pulls the child in, and the protective altar comes out. So let's say now this is out um, in the present here and now. Okay, so that the abuser is still seeing the same body, but this on the inside, the core person has been tucked away for safekeeping, for protection, and the primary person, I'm sorry, the primary altar, so the first altar is now out. So during the abuse, this part of the core person now is taking the abuse, has the memory, and has all the feelings. After the abuse happens, it's safe now for the core person to come back out. So there's a switching of position. Okay, so that's the first time the splitting took place. So this core part, when the dissociation happened, this core person now, now it's a child, doesn't have the memory during the time of the abuse. So let's say the abuse happened from 3 to 3.30 or 3 to 4 in the afternoon. Let's say mom goes off to work and from 3 to 4, stepdad, who's an abuser, has access to the kid. So when mom leaves at 2.30, dad waits long enough to make sure mom makes it to work. And so at 3 o'clock, this child knows the sound of the footsteps, comes in the room. And when that happens, the child doesn't, I'm convinced now, the child doesn't so much go away as gets pulled in by, and let's pretend again, there are only two squares on this entire white sheet of paper. So we just have the core person and the primary protector and substitute. So we're just dealing with these two, okay? So from three to four, this primary part is taking the abuse. They have the conscious recollection. They have the memory. At four o'clock, the perp walks away, and now it's safe for the core person to come back. So the child consciously, or the conscious part of the child, comes back, have no recollection, but all they know is they feel the adrenaline. They feel the trauma of it. It's, it's affecting the brain. So the child has the same feelings, but it's manifested in anxiety. So they're going to be, now it's going to be affecting their personality, their a child's ability to sit still, child's ability to concentrate. So the child is being affected, but he doesn't, he or she doesn't know why. And of course, being a child, the child doesn't think about these things. So they're all we will notice, let's say we're a teacher and now the primary person, meaning the kid, comes to school, the kid feels the physiological, the biochemical effects of our uh, primary protective substitute alter, right? Um, but they don't know why, so they can't put into words. Plus, they probably have been threatened, but they may or may not consciously know they've been threatened. They just also know that um, they need to be careful. So they go to school, they have a lot of the physiological effects, but they don't know the splitting has taken place. The perpetrator, if they get a, away with it, now they're going to continue that process. So now we have one splitting going on, but sexual deviance increases. So now increases in terms of frequency and intensity and diabolical nature. So what happens is, let's say uh, a time of another abuse, but now it's been going on a year, and either the perpetrator is becoming more seductive, that's still probably happening, but now uh, birds of a feather flock together, sadistic people find themselves, find each, I'm sorry, the perps find each other online because they're on the dark web or, or they, they know how to find each other. And so now he might even invite people. So now we are having the beginning of gang rapes. Um, now we have ritualistic stuff. So it's not just one-on-one, -on -one. now it's uh, they're renting the kid out. So other people are having access. Now it's getting worse. So while the abuse happens now at three o'clock, but let's say it's a Saturday or they're going to go camping, just stepfather and stepdaughter. And during the camping trip, there's other men. 
So the core person now, we're dissociating, they blank out, and that same first one is out to take the primary one is out to take the abuse, but now the abuse has increased and it's too overwhelming for this one. So lo and behold, we have another one to step in and take the primary's place. So now within the core person, now we have the, frag the second fragmentation. So that's why I just called the secondary protector and substitute. So this, this um, part, the lighter red um, is really the backup now for uh, for the primary. So in terms of internal systems, these two are gonna know each other very well and they will share very similar feelings, very similar perspective. That principle of one taking over for the other, but the primary one, the very first one will tend to be the one that will be very um, important in the system because that was the very first one as far as altar that was there to protect the child. As the abuse continues, the primary or one of the primary ones will eventually become the guardian. And that is the place of one of these same altars, one of these same parts that are very protective. And I colored them red because they have the anger. In terms of guardian, the perpetrator, every perpetrator wants to ensure one major thing, which is they don't go to prison. So the perpetrator, since they know at this level of perpetration, these perpetrators know how to create this dynamic. You're splitting the kid's personality off. Well, if you're a perpetrator, none of us are, but to get inside the mind of a perpetrator and you want to make sure you don't go to prison, what you're going to do is this. Since you know that eventually this type of um, world will be created with these different levels, and I'll describe these in a moment, then what you're going to do is you're going to leverage or you're going to use the fact that as these alters or parts are being created, they don't know that they are all contained within the same body. So the perpetrator has an advantage. Perpetrator, of course he does, right? But the perpetrator has an advantage of knowing that when he is interacting with each of these different parts, they think they're separate and distinct from the core person. But the perpetrator, of course, knows talking to the same face, the same eyes, but each of these parts don't know they are within the same body. So if I'm a perpetrator and I've been perping enough on this kid, what's happened is this. Now I'll go through these to give you a sense of and each of these will tend to have actual names. Now, if it's satanic ritual abuse, they will have names, but the perpetrator will have given a name. But deep under, underneath the name that the perp gave, there's still regular names Okay, that the altar or the part will have given him or herself, but they may have never had a chance to actually realize what their actual name is. So if I'm a perpetrator, and again, I'm not, but to for you know just kind of go with what i'm saying here right the mind of a perpetrator since i worked with perpetrators now for 15 years so if i'm a perpetrator what i'm thinking about is i want to ensure that i'm never going to get busted so i'm using this reality on the inside i'm using this phenomenon now to be able to allow me to perp but also to keep the core person in enslaved or entrapped that nobody's ever going to tell so I get them to keep the secret for me. And I will do it in whatever way I can. But the more sadistic, then I'm certainly not being buddy-buddy with this child, right? We understand the, the perp who's the teacher that cozies up to the kid and the babysitter that gains their confidence and has that special relationship, right? That's not a sadistic kind of abuser. Now, later on, they might become threatening. But the kind of sadistic abuser we're talking about never established that uh, nice relationship with the child. They're just now going to harm the child, straight up harm. So 
they can't and they're not going to the perp is not going to rely upon the the nature of the bond that they've established that fake bond they're going to rely upon fear they're going to leverage fear so after they reach a point where they've started to be the perp where the perp has started to become sadistic enough once the perp knows they've created enough of these parts then they're going to since they since the perp knows that on the inside these different parts or alters can not only hear one another but oftentimes they can see one another the original film sybil with sally fields is a very good one to go back and watch there's one scene where it shows like an attic in her mind and it's showing what she sees on the inside it's showing the different parts so the perp knows that as the altars are creating certainly each altar is going to hear one another but likely they're also going to be able to internally see one another okay it's not delusional but this is the power of the mind so he so what they're going to do is then the perp is going to leverage that knowledge knowing that the altars right now because they're too close uh, to the forest for the trees knowing that the altars don't know that they're in the same body so they're now going to create trauma they're going to create more than one altar and at some point in time what they're going to do is this the perps know that it's only a matter of time until there will be one part and i colored that part in green who will want to get help, who wants to stop the abuse by disclosing. It's only a matter of time till one of those parts, one of those childlike parts, will try to come to the surface. Okay, so up here is conscious awareness and surface. So again, but for right now, we have all of these different layers, but suffice it to say, kind of the next layer up is is more conscious so the perps know it's only a matter of time as the abuse increases that a part wants the the harm to stop and will disclose so the perps are going to have to make sure that on the inside that they make sure that one of the parts prevents that childlike part from ever talking. So we're going to suppress it here. Okay. So we're going to call it, what do I call this? The internal perspective. Oh, I'm sorry, protective. Sorry about that. I'm reading my own internal protective guardian. And it's also self destructive. Okay. So we're going to call this one the enforcer or whatever name you would want to give this one. So what the perp would do is this the perp would say, to one of the alders they know they have a sense which one is going to be and oftentimes it was it's this original one that's been around longer and has taken more of a key role okay so it may be that the guardian is really the primary protective one who now has taken on a different role okay but either way this becomes kind of the the shot collar down here Okay. And what are they calling the shots for? Ultimately, every single part, every single altar is there to protect the core person. Every single one of these circles on here, every single one of these parts, ultimately, whether they believe it or not or know it or not, are here on this chart because they gave, they laid their lives down on behalf of this core person, this core part. A lot of them don't feel it, but ultimately they're going to need to know that they're all very good and they tried their best. And so they all are trying their best. They have the best of intentions, ultimately to keep the core person, the core part protected, the core child, the small part of them. So the perp knows it. The perp knows that every part that's being creative, uh, created, every altar that's been created ultimately is wanting to protect the core person the perp knows that on the inside they not only can hear but probably also see the others and so the perp now leverages that and they say this we're going to call this jim we're going to call this part jimmy i'm just going to give 
What's the name? Now, again, it may have been Jimmy who transitioned to being an older one. Okay, but we're going to we're going to call this Jimmy. We're going to give this altar the uh, name Jimmy. So the perp is harming is going to begin to ritualistically harm the core person. Let's just call her uh, Mary, but we'll call her a little Mary. So let's say Mary came to a session, and Mary has deep down inside a little Mary. Okay, Jimmy is there. He was there to protect. If a perp is the evil kind of perp, what perp isn't, then he knows this whole dynamic is happening. So what he'll say is this. The perp will create enough pain. All of a sudden, Jimmy will come back out. We've got Jimmy's attention because we're harming Mary. Like, or did I call her Jane? Oh, Mary. Okay, I should write names down. And the next chart on the next episode, we'll actually have names in here. Okay, so we'll say that the core person is Mary. So uh, a perp starts to hurt Mary. Jimmy comes in still to take the abuse, or somebody else may have another part. But Jimmy's aware of this because Jimmy's one of the original ones. Jimmy's one of the older ones. And so the perp, having gotten Jimmy's attention, the perp says this, that Jimmy, if... And I'm going to call this Tina. Now, let's say Tina is a six-year-old. So let's say this perpetration has been going on a while. So the, the perp always knows there's going to be one child that has kind of gotten away from him, but senses it's there, but kind of elusive. So the perp is going to ensure that Tina is going to be quiet. So the perp is going to tell Jimmy, Jimmy, if... Tina ever talks, we're going to kill little Mary. So on the inside, the alders can't figure out that they've just been played, that they've been manipulated into what? Ultimately, self-destruction. Because if Jimmy kills Tina's body, slices Tina's wrists, causes Tina to hang herself or to take poison, what happens to the entire system, which is in one body? What happens to little Mary? Right? They all go down. But because the altars see themselves as separate, then if one altar is harming themselves, uh, harming another altar, or if they're harming themselves, like up here, we have self-harm, they can't see that as they're harming self, they're also harming who? They're harming the core person. They don't know that. So little by little, the process of therapy is to begin to help the core person. And you're really going to, as a therapist or in treatment, this is where you're going. You're going to start, this is you up here, any client, any person that's beginning to wonder, is this real? You're going to begin to explore all of this. But little by little, let me do something here if I can. Uh, let me see. What, what am I going to insert? Oh, okay. Let me try it like this. Hot off the press. We're doing this live. So you're going to come into therapy. Oh, this is a pretty good way to do it. You're going to come into therapy like that. That's you coming into therapy with symptoms. And you don't know that there's a whole lot of stuff on the inside, uh, meaning you're aware of it, but you don't know that you have a whole world on the inside of you. So little by little, I've got the, <laughs> there we go, right? What's going to happen, the first thing that has to happen, and the reason why I recommended symptoms, so this is you with your primary public person, this is just you, and you have a conscious awareness of you. But as I suggested doing some journaling, as I suggested you begin to listen to the voices, this was to introduce you to those parts of you. Again, right now, you're just going to have to risk believing there may, be, that's why I say this is journey, right? There may be a lot more to this than meets the eye. I don't want to discourage you, but I just want to help you know that you're, you're going to begin a process that will eventually take you kind of um, move this like this. It's going to take you deeper and deeper to get to know you.
Okay. So when you come into therapy or when somebody begins that process, let me, uh, let me cover everything up. Okay. So this is you maybe listening to this podcast for the very first time. And you're beginning to wonder if what you're sensing and dreams you've been having and flashbacks that you've been having, is it just your imagination or is something really under the surface? And so the fir very first thing is you're going to be spending a fair bit of time getting to know you. So that we would call this the current, or I would call this the current primary, meaning here and now, and th they're key. These are the ones you've been working with and not knowing it. These are the ones that have been heavy lifting as far as helping you in your everyday life. These are your parts, and I call them, I didn't add the, oh, well, that should have, that should have quotation marks. Okay, maybe I can add them right now. That's anal retentive. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we have what I'm calling your support team. Now, I'm not saying that every part of your support team has been kind because you have parts of you that are, oh, I didn't have a critic in here. Okay, so we would add a critic in here. Um, what happened here? We could also, as a matter of fact, sometimes the defense of an argumentative one is not just, that's toward other people, but this can turn it in on you. As a matter of fact, when that tends to happen, or the reason that tends to happen is when you can't handle it anymore, and that sounds funny because the one thing you have dedicated yourself to doing and priding yourself is you never say die. You will just keep going. That's part of your issue. You're too darn strong for your own darn good. But the question is this, how much of your day or week do you remember? If you can't remember, let's say today or yesterday, you know there was a chunk of three hours that you can't remember, but somehow the work got done. I'll tell you what happened. There was enough stress, either coworkers, either your boss, either the quantity of work, either something was going on to increase the stress level to where it became too much. And as a matter of fact, if you think back through, ask yourself, what's the last thing you remember? You were sitting at your desk or you were doing that phone call or you were uh, bringing up that Word document and all of a sudden before you know it, okay? So what happened was this. There was, there was internally, they were sensing what was going on for you and they were very sacrificial. They pulled you. I used to think again that you kind of took yourself away. They, that's not how it happens, I don't believe. They pulled you in. So, your detailed part, and I notice we have very responsible part. I tried to give different gradations or different shades. Now, to the average co-worker of yours to your boss, they wouldn't notice their, their very fine tuning, almost identical, okay, but a little bit different. And so this part may not be as detailed as this part. So let's say we're just going to call her Jane now. So Jane goes to work. Jane is feeling overwhelmed at this particular because she has a lot going on, a lot of stressors, maybe even starting to have flashbacks, but she has to focus at work. She She's looking at the time it's going by. She's getting more stressed. And before she knows it, she doesn't even know it. She's been pulled in. And that other detailed part, let me see if I can enlarge it. And so just for sake of size, we're going to put her down here. So the primary part did I call her Jane? Yeah. So Jane now, so the next time we do it, I'll actually have names. Um, so Jane now, all she knows is she doesn't even know this has happened. This is during the time of dissociation. Let's say Jane dissociates from three to five at work. So the last thing she knows, she looked down and it was three o'clock. She has to have that report done by um, five and she's really stressed. So all she knows is the last time she looked at the clock, it was three. A detailed part comes out, finishes the report, hands it in. And then before she knows it, it's five o'clock. And her indicator, whatever that is, either the bell, uh, you know, somehow she knows it's five o'clock. And so she's back sitting at her desk. 
And all she knows is she didn't know how she got it. She doesn't, I mean, got through it, didn't know how she accomplished it, but she's exhausted. Why? Because there's a lot of intensity, but she's just thankful she got it in. She doesn't even know if it was correct, but she has a hunch that somehow it probably will be, but she doesn't remember writing any of it. So, so Jane can't recall from three to five. Well, who can that part? Because she was out. Well, let's call, okay, this Jane, we're going to call this, uh, let's just call this Sally. Okay. So Sally, yeah. Okay. So Sally is the detailed part. Jane is the primary part. Okay. So Sally will, S Sally will step in and pull Jane out of the way to get the job done when Jane becomes overwhelmed and that's the key issue okay that's going to happen in every single one of these cases and the small writing i have here so the support team serves as backup if the above part really we're just going to say the core per or the core primary person it's the easiest way to think of this and what i would say is this is you right because part of the challenge when you start to go through the therapy is your a very normal question is, well, who am I? Like, am I one of these? Are they? So I, I tell my clients, don't even worry about it. You're just you. Right. Now, the one thing and IFS is great, but the one thing I disagree just a little bit, but I'm not giving mixed messages. OK, you want to go with IFS is wonderful. OK, but Frank Anderson one time was asked, do you, as a therapist, do you need to establish a primary relationship with each of these parts. And he actually said, no, doesn't make him bad. It just means good people differ. And I felt very good about myself because I differ with that. As a therapist, I'm going to actually begin to get to know these different parts better than the core person. Now, I know I said core as far as the core childlike part. So maybe they're uh, in the future charts, I'll differentiate. This is the core childlike part. part. Uh, back in the 80s, we used to, the term 80s and 90s, a child within. Okay, so the core childlike part of me is this person, okay, of the survivor is this person. What I am using as far as this term, the core or primary here and now person. So who are you? Of course, you are that person. Well, are you that? Of course you are, but don't worry about that. That'll confuse you. Okay. So just relax and enjoy the flight, so to speak. Meaning, okay, all you have to worry about is you and beginning to risk believing that the voices in your head and the way you've been able to function and the gaps in your memory make sense. Because if you could line up all these parts, they have all your gaps. They have all your memory. Your brain is not broken. Now, some of them will actually have gaps, and guess who has those? Right? Don't get overwhelmed. I just want you to see where you're going in therapy, because really what therapy is going to do is little by little, let me, um, right, is going to uncover. So the first stage is, and this is very much the first stage of therapy. How long could this take? As long as you make it <laughs> as long as it takes. Um, if I hate to tell you, if a part of you, and this doesn't make you bad, good, bad, or indifferent, but let's say this is really freaking you out and you just can't buy into this concept, you could be still at a place where kind of now you see them, now you, now you see them, now you don't, now you sense them, now you don't. You could be doing this for a couple of years in therapy. Okay, so really the first phase of therapy, that's why if you're not ready for this, don't start, because what will happen is they will start to risk believing you're serious and they'll make themselves known in one way or another. Can you imagine if you were one of the uh, support team and your core person that you've been there to support finally says, okay, is anybody there? And you actually take them up on their offer, but the angry one, right? You want to know why when you get so angry before you know it, you've insulted people. Well, at that moment, I tell you what, you get pulled in because you can't handle it. And guess what part, right? We're going to say, for lack of a term, Ruby. Okay, Ruby comes out because red and 
we'll just call her Ruby, or maybe um, Jack, right? Because maybe a part of you associates intense anger with male. So it's Jack. We'll, we'll call it Jack, as a matter of fact. So let's say, so we're going to say you are female, literally, you're a female, but Jack is very much male, which, by the way, this show, this, hopefully then you now understand why I'm so against what's going on in the trans movement, because perps love the trans movement. Why? Because they can cover over perpetration and they know there are parts of the wounded person that don't want to be female, don't feel female, like they're female, don't want to have female body parts, don't want anything to do that with what perpetrators were interested in. And so guess what kind of surgery Jack might be interested in? Yeah, chopping off its breasts. But in a way, Jack doesn't even know that he's not just chopping off his breasts, but whose breasts are he, is he chopping off? Mary's. The answer to all of this is not surgery. Okay, it's healing. It's emotional healing. It's trauma surgery, right? But that is uh, emotional surgery. Okay. Um, so when I say trauma surgery, it's emotional healing. So we have gradations, and I just listed a number of these that probably represent the the different aspects of our personalities. But that'll become segmented, but also because of what's happened in the past. So there will usually be some that will be, usually about three, that will be interchangeable at work. Now, there could be more, but there's there's a cluster of these that they know themselves, if I can, okay? So you can see how responsible, detailed, and dutiful, that would work well at work. So oftentimes, there's going to be a lot of movement between these two who are supportive of Mary. Okay, so Mary will be pulled in by these two a lot. Let's say Mary goes home and um, or has some friends or even at work or at church or whatever, where all of a sudden Mary doesn't mind. <laughs> you know, when you're helpful, what are people going to do? They're going to begin to add. <laughs> they're going to ask for favors. Well, guess who you've just loaded down? Okay, but the helpful one will say yes, because the helpful one believes it's spiritual to be nice. So we're going to have to help, help <laughs> try to get, we're going to have to help the helpful one to have boundaries. So already you can see, let's say the helpful one comes out. Um, let's say Mary goes to church and she's just heard a sermon on <laughs> being a servant. And so somebody's going to hit her up at church to uh, do bring meals. Sorry. Well, Mary doesn't have time to make meals, but all of a sudden somebody pulls at her heartstrings or catches her off guard and she's starting to get flustered and overwhelmed. And before you know it, oh, sorry. <clears throat> Who steps out to carry on the conversation and to agree to stuff? <clears throat> It's the helpful part. Now, again, I'll eventually have names for all these. And a hint, you actually do. If you're not, if you're somebody that's sensing this, all your parts have names. If you want to know them, ask them to sign their name after something they've written. Okay. Um, and the names can be anything. Okay. But that way, you're not just saying, hey, you. Okay. They actually want to be known. Okay. So let's say already loaded down at work, goes to church. The helpful one says, oh, I don't mind. I'll, I'll, I'll deliver you meals on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday because you're having um, oral surgery. Okay, so now after uh, the helpful person has signed them up for something, guess how Mary feels now coming back from church? Oh my gosh, right? So now guess who's getting all over the, the helpful one? So the helpful one, well, you know, is in the doghouse. These two are pounding them, right? Because now they're frustrated, but also maybe these two don't have access to their anger. So the angry one comes in and really starts to get all over the helpful one. It starts to condemn them, say, you can't believe it. You're so irresponsible. What the heck? Or more like, why are you letting people take advantage of us like this? You always do this. And then this one will say, and do you know how much work we have? And 
gosh, I, I can't handle this and the detailed one. Uh, if I have one more thing on my, <laughs> my plate to do and I can't get it all done. And so now we have internal dialogue going on. Well, the helpful one is starting to get overwhelmed or maybe the helpful one starts to try to explain. And then before you know it, it's too much. And so there's a little part of them that says, I just, you know what? I just want to go have fun. I want to forget about all of it. And so now we have a playful one that comes out. And this also, in, in the future, we're going to find out that there may be right here, some spontane spontaneity and irresponsibility or very naive. Okay. So this, so these also are the ones that are co-conscious are being influenced. So you can see the extent of this whole work. Let me see if I can, there we go. Are being influenced by another part of them, a subconscious part of them. Okay. But there's a part of the person that when it gets too much, they just go and do something to make themselves happy. Okay. Whatever that is. But sometimes it's absolutely uh, suppressed. Okay, so we're going to put uh, Mary back out there. Um, how about if Mary is guilted into something, or she believes, uh, honor thy mother and father, or she has an abusive spouse, uh, tell her to get in line. Well, all of a sudden, uh, this one who believes that you have to be submissive and has a working definition of uh, you, you honor thy mother, mother and father, period, no matter what. So mother and father, let's say it's Mother's Day. Here we go. So Mother's Day coming along. Um, Mary really doesn't, did I call her Mary? Yeah, Mary doesn't, uh, hates Mother's Day, but the submissive part, because the guilt-ridden part as well, um, will, will be the one to fulfill that. So pulls uh, Mary in, and we'll call that, I don't know who should, we should call that. Uh, we'll call that um, Rapunzel. Okay, so Rapunzel, kind of like the cult member, comes out and dutifully makes it through Mother's Day. Uh, while they're at mom's house, it gets too much. And so there'll be a part, what happened here? Be a part that will be very detached, emotionally detached. So let's say mom, uh, they're at mom's house for Mother's Day and uh, mom is just berating or humiliating and shaming. So there's an emotionally detached one that will come out. Um, that one goes in and Mary is back at work now the next Monday. And Mary has to, uh, oh, let's say Mary is commended for the work that she did. Remember on Friday, got the uh, report done. And so Mary is actually given a bonus or Mary is commended. Mary is given a promotion. And because that feels strange to Mary, any kind of positive stuff, then what will happen is maybe a pessimistic part will come out and pull Mary in. And that pessimistic part will start to basically say, well, no matter what you want, it's only a matter of time till the worst case scenario happens and um, it's probably going to rain on my parade, so I can't let myself. So don't don't get too excited. So the pessimistic part will tamper that down, because if the pes if if uh, Mary starts to get too excited, then what may happen? The playful one may. Oh, sorry, I grabbed the words here. Uh, then the playful one may come out, and we know what. Oh, we know what happens when the playful one comes out. Then she stirs up the pot, does something irresponsible, and makes life more difficult. So maybe the pessimistic one is also keeping uh, control over the, the playful one. So this one reigns on uh, Mary's parade. Uh, the more opportunity she gets, maybe uh, the pessimistic one is saying, well, you know what, they're just going to take advantage of us and no use getting your uh, hopes up. And what happens if you actually start to finally be given a chance, you know you're going to blow it, uh, and people will begin to notice that you're climbing the corporate ladder, uh, good things will start to happen, and you know what happens when good things happen. So before you know it, the anxious one comes in, and it feels like it clouds up, it really pulls Mary in, and now we might be having a panic attack, where we, out of the blue, we start to feel really anxious. So they're can be parts that are just straight up anxious. Uh, the pessimistic one can be, the, they're, 
I can even draw another one. We might call it the depressive one. So uh, you can see how many emotions, this could even be in one day, this could be Friday, right? And so um, Mary gets her, uh, pulls herself up by her bootstraps, maybe she takes her Xanax and that's okay. But just as she's starting to leave, uh, some coworker comes up and, or the boss comes up, says something, does something, and uh, Mary isn't gonna stand up for herself, isn't gonna protect herself, isn't gonna uh, have boundaries. And before you know it, guess who does? And that angry part, I forget what we called it, my short-term memory. Um, but uh, Jimmy, or I think we called it a guy's name, um, comes out, gives that person a piece of their mind, or they're driving to the grocery store. Uh, Mary's having to go get groceries for uh, Friday night dinner, and somebody cuts in front, and then all of a sudden, very quickly, instantaneously, who comes out, the defensive or aggressive one, gives them a piece of their mind, and then all of a sudden, before you know it, Mary is back, and Mary sees the look on the person's face and is mortified that um, that just slipped out. And that becomes their day, and that becomes their week and their month, and this has been, in a way, their life. Now, if some of these didn't seem familiar, but we could add depression, what I would say is this. This may capture pretty good categories. Okay, So if we were to kind of uh, make this representative of someone's personality, this is probably going to be representative of those categories. Okay, We could, we could add a few more in there, certainly, but this is probably going to capture it. So if this seems familiar, I'm oh, sorry about that. Right. As far as the idea of the switching, that before you know it, and the internal dialogue. So the internal dialogue would come first. Sometimes it's very spontaneous before you know it. And um, the dissociation, the gaps in time. Okay, That's what's going on. So the thing to ask yourself, the thing to ask Jane, so if Jane were to be listening to this, or if Jane goes to therapists, the first the first aspect or uh, part of therapy is little by little to help Jane understand this is not her imagination that these are parts and you need to get to know them and that's really where therapy is going to um spend a fair bit of time this is where the journaling is going to come in this is where you're going to first uh, learn to get to know them. And at this point in therapy, they're learning to trust you and you're learning to get to know them. I should say you're learning to get to know them and they're learning to trust that you are not going to go away. Right? That you're not going to get overwhelmed to where you disappear and then guess what they have to do? That's right. And really, it would be this, because if you get overwhelmed, that's why you're going to get, um, if you're going to deny this, then it's only a matter of time till life keeps repeating itself. So if you deny the reality of this, that means they have to continue. But now, unfortunately, because you've listened to this and you're beginning to hear a little more closely these voices, and you're beginning to see the signs and the symptoms of this reality going on, what happens is now you're more disconcerted because now you're hearing them more. You're seeing the gaps of time. You're seeing the indicators. Uh, you know, you're seeing the rapid move uh, switching, especially in the reflection of other people that you're talking to that are experiencing the mood switches. You're losing track of time. You're losing items. You feel like you're coming apart at the seams. And you're starting to feel these feelings more that really they have. So you're going to get overwhelmed faster. So the reason why better to not start this process than to take a glimpse and, and try to put it back in the bottle is because what you can't. And so you're going to be more fragile because you have a sense now that they're there. And so what happens is you're going to get more easily overwhelmed. And anytime you get overwhelmed, they have to step in. 
they will step in. Okay. So, because they are there for you. So, this one will then, the detailed part will have to spend more time out. And it's sort of easy for you. It's not easy for you, right? But, but what that means is they're having to, they, so the detailed one pulls you in. You have no recollection of going to work. You had no idea that you went to the meeting, that you finished the project, who you interacted with, because you're now unconscious. Now, when I say uh, co-conscious, they are co-conscious with you. They can hear what's going on. That's why I sort of put the semi-permeable um, membrane, so to speak, meaning they can hear what's going on up top, but you really can't hear until you want to begin to. So what will happen is there will be more switching. So there's already been switching, but if you start then stop this, you are going to start driving yourself crazy, and now you increase the load on your support team, and they're going to begin to become increasingly tired. They're already tired. But you, if you start and stop this, then they're going to become even more tired. Eventually, what's going to happen, and we will see this on future, this has probably been enough information, then the process of therapy, little by little, is going to be from the top down. Okay? To get to, eventually, you're going to get to know all those and what happens. Now, I'll just um, delete this just for one second. I'll push him over to the side here. This, uh, let's see if I can grab this here. Okay, we're going to put him over to the side just for a second. Okay. So just know that there's a conscious part of you. There's a semi-conscious or co-conscious part in this sense. You've been hearing them. They're very much aware of you. You haven't been aware of them. So the first place to start is what's called up down that you this is us here this is the primary person this is jane you need to get to know each one of them maybe i can draw can i draw this we'll draw nope how about it's funny in real time i'm drawing something here folks right here we're yeah. going to go with this so we're going to do that and now i'm going to enlarge it so we can actually see our line there we are Okay, so here is the means of communication. So what you're going to have to do first is you're going to need to begin to get to know each one. Okay, actually, we'll put that right there. Okay, so journaling is a means of you beginning to get to know each of your parts. So in journaling, when I suggest you start with, especially if you're still with me, if you've been listening to this, you write an open-ended question and then set it aside, close the journal. It can be a notebook, it's whatever. But write the question, what does anybody think about what John shared? And somebody is going to respond. It may be more than one. But each of these have a different style of handwriting. But the question for you, it's the question they have, is what happens if what happens if you hear from that one? What you may actually hear from is the angry one, is the upset one, the one that's been lecturing you. Oftentimes, they they're tired. Now, Part of them may be saying, tell, tell John he's all full of hooey. But uh, probably what you're going to hear is this. Well, it's about time you start listening. We've been trying to tell you this. Okay, so this one, you know, the one that's been lecturing you in your mind. Now, the dutiful, the dutiful one also has a tendency to lecture. Um, I'm sorry, dutiful and detailed. Because these are the ones that are frustrated. Because they've been having to, there you go. Right? They've been having to, to do the heavy lifting when you get yourself overwhelmed. So you're going to have to kind of get to know them first. Typically, it's going to be those. Um, but some of the ones that are more than happy, if you're ready, uh, to start talking, the anxious part, there's a pessimistic. Sometimes the pessimistic, the dutiful, aggressive, 
they will sound familiar because sometimes you will have three or four that are kind of closely connected. We could paint that or uh, color that, shade that as different gradations of red, okay? But there's inevitably going to be, and so I just use this to kind of conceptualize categories, okay? So you can probably count on four to six, usually six. How many do we have here? Two, four, six, eight, nine, okay? So you can count on there's probably at least six. If you set a limit, say, okay, you know what? I'm okay if there's six, but if there's more, I'm not, I'm not listening to anything, right? Then they're not going to start talking to you. You're going to sabotage it. Okay, so let me now, so I've given you the, the first task, the first homework assignment is to begin to risk believing that, here we go. I'm going to go back to our, I'm going to cover everything up. Okay, so I don't want you to worry about anything. I don't know where that pink thing came from. That's strange. Okay, there we go. Okay, this is your homework assignment. It is first to just risk believing, because right now, as a matter of fact, where you sit today, so to speak, is just you, right? As you're listening to this, it's just you, but how are things going? And are any of the symptoms, the ind indicators, do any of those feel familiar? If so, what are you hearing right now on the inside? Are you hearing some of these voices? As a matter of fact, also, are you feeling anything on your cranium, literally? Because oftentimes, you will find that each of these parts have a certain location on your cranium that they knock or they make themselves known or there will be a range, or there'll be a pattern. Like uh, it starts at the occipital, where the back of your head moves to the left and ends up the left side of the frontal, the, 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 right? Just above, let's say the left eye, I'm making this up. But so some will have a region or a pattern or a specific area. They're getting your attention. Okay, so begin to be mindful of the fact that the body keeps a score. Okay, so the probably the first two things, the real question is, again, do you want to know? If you don't want to know, then you're, not, you're going no further than this. If you're willing to risk, then what you're, what you're looking for, meaning you're, you're setting off on a journey to get to know you and the everyday. And that's, that's going to take, quite frankly, a number of months. Okay, because it's going, to, it's you starting to become familiar with you. I can't see this. Sorry, my camera's in my way. There we go. Okay, so it's going to take a while. You have to get to know them, and then so that's straight up and down. So really, we could say, so copy, and then we're going to paste. Oh, right in the header there. Paste. Okay. So what'll happen is you're going to get to know each one. So that's why it's going to take a little bit of time. Okay, probably the most important one that you need to get to know is the one you've not wanted to hear from, that you've been battling, that you've been trying to push out of your mind. Why? It's going to be the angry one. But I want to tell you about the angry one. Maybe we'll bring it in for a landing. I'll just uh, give you a brief overview of where we're going with this. Okay, the angry one, the self-critical one, has been the one that's been there for you. If you think about it, the times that it was too much, the conflict that you've had, who stepped up and took control of the conversation? Who set your boundaries? Who gave pushback? Wasn't you, right? Because you wouldn't dare say that. The question is, who did? The part of you that, yes, the part of you that has been getting down on you all these years, but at the same time, if it weren't for that part, you would have just been left with you. And that part of you probably just said, tell him, John. Okay, there you go, right? So this part of you actually, and this is true for all, these are your best friends. Now, the reason I'm saying you're going to, so the most important, that sounds funny, and none of them will really take offense at it because everybody is essential, every part, okay? 
but the one that is most crucial because the one that can give you the strength that you need to do this journey and the one that you need to get buy-in. And in a way, it's buy-in that you are going to listen because the problem is this, you haven't been listening. And so whenever it gets overwhelming, why does it get overwhelming? Because you either agree to things or you don't have the boundaries. And so you agree to things and you get overwhelmed and then you get paralyzed. And what happens when you get paralyzed? Yep, you go into a panic attack, you're non-functional, you are, are at risk of losing your job or you keep doing that and the people keep taking advantage of you and it's just never ending. You feel like the hamster on the wheel, right? And when is it ever going to be your turn? And how long are you going to be able to keep this up? And no wonder a party who hates going to church because church just is more obligations and it is guilt tripping. And uh, right, we're just going, going with reality. I'm keeping it real here. I'm not, right? Just go with me for a moment, right? Because a party who feels that way, you would never utter that, of course, but what's real? Okay, what's true? Now, let me put that up here. Okay, now. This is your homework assignment. You need to begin to establish communication. You need to identify who's there. Okay, you need to get to know you. Now, there's a finite number, but you can't set limits on this, right? You can't, it's normal. You're very normal if you say, well, Okay, six, like four, I'd be more comfortable if there were four, I can identify four, six, but no, no, anything beyond six is crazy. Well, that means you're going to let six, how many do we have here? Two, four, six, eight, nine. Well, if you set a limit, then some of them are just going to have to be quiet. Yet, guess what? Some of them are having to step in, so it's still not going to work. You have to be willing to find out who's there. And so this line, this direct line is you're going to have to start direct lines of communication between you and yourself. Okay, let me see if I can get him right there. Okay, so in a way, we could say it's up down because in a way, this circle would be, you know, clear across, right? So we could draw the lines up and down. And Frank Anderson, I like, I like that. So you're there. So you could see how these lines would be straight up and down. So the first part of therapy is the beginning of that exploration of how many parts are there that have helped you manage during the day. So you're getting in touch with what are called your co-conscious parts. That, that could take, that's certainly going to take months. Okay. But the good news is once you get to know them, then the next stage will be this, by the way, it's just to let you know what you have to look forward to there. Believe it or not, there are some parts that really hate or strongly dislike. They don't really hate because they don't have a sense right now, but they do not appreciate certain other parts, right? So for instance, the angry part does not appreciate uh, the helpful part, because the helpful part gets them all overwhelmed. They especially, very few, especially dislike the playful kind, the playful part. So they have no appreciation in a way. Now, some of these do tag team. So let's say detailed and dutiful um, appreciate one another. Okay. But nobody in this case probably appreciates playful. Oh, sorry can't grab it anyways. Um, so well, you know where I'm talking about. So um, helpful. Okay. It depends upon what it does to the entire system. Um, the aggressive one probably does not like the anxious one. Doesn't like the, so uh, it doesn't definitely does not like the submissive one. So eventually what's going to have to happen is if you're here to stay, so to speak, you're going to establish a relationship with each one then eventually you're going to begin to help each of them get to know one another. Now they know one another, so they think, but they have a lot of them don't have appreciation for what drives the other. So it's like you have an American football team because for some of your viewers, they're from Europe and 
football is soccer, but think about American football. Okay. You are the quarterback and here's your team. Are there nine? Yeah, that's not bad. I think we need 11, huh? Okay. Right now, up to this point, you've never been having a huddle. And so you have very competent and capable. Now we may say that the anxious one also is very um, cautious, right? So stays out of trouble, never risks. Okay. So in a way, they they want the best for you, but they just are so gun shy that they never get out of their comfort zone. Okay. That would be a pretty good one. Um, this pessimistic one doesn't let you start things or doesn't let you finish because the closer you get to the goal, if it gets snatched away from you, the greater pain you're going to feel. So it stops things before you get your hopes up. Submission is good in the right way as far as if it is organizationally or if it is by choice. But if you feel like a slave, that's not good. Uh, detached, that's that part that can be that can either numb out or not going to take it personally. That's a good quality in a way. That's when you set boundaries, you need to be detached. But this also, the detrimental part is they don't let themselves get close to anybody. So each of these have positive and negative facets to their segment of your personality. And so the goal is for each, by the way, to become a little more well-rounded. And we'll talk about that on another one. Right? but also for each to appreciate the other so that also certain ones don't have to always be doing the heavy lifting. Okay, so that's that's going to take the for, um, months, okay, not to discourage you. That's why I also recommend a minimum of two sessions per week. Okay, your therapist should be willing to do, if you have to pay cash, certainly a sliding fee scale. Okay, if a therapist is only doing once a week at full fee, part of me wants to say the therapist does not. Well, okay, I'm just going to say it, right? I got to speak my mind. Uh, doesn't have a heart for this. There is no way that a therapist can do the job that we are called to do to walk alongside someone in this journey one hour once a week, you're going to, in my estimation, as a therapist, I'll speak to any therapist listening out there. If a, if another therapist is seeing someone one hour a week, and if they stop with insurance, um, if they don't offer a sliding fee scale or something, okay, but if it's just, if you're seeing a client once a week, because that's what insurance is going to pay, pardon me, I'll say shame on you. Do not do that, okay, because that is it's too long between sessions. At the very least, you need two sessions, and I recommend back-to-back, -back, um, two hours. Now, as time goes on, but at least minimum of two hours, um, I actually give away a minimum of $25,000 of free counseling every year. Why? Because wow, right? These these clients can't afford it. And what am I going to do? Right, because they can't pay. So I will give them a free session. The second hour oftentimes will be free. So you count those up, a couple of clients like that per year, and um, you're into thousands and thousands of dollars. But um, if somebody doesn't have a heart for this, then they shouldn't be a trauma therapist, in my estimation. Uh, we can make money. We can, you know, we need to earn our keep, but still this is not a money-making proposition. So if, if your therapist doesn't seem to have a heart for this, okay, let me unveil this one more time to show you where we'll go on, on future uh, podcasts. And I'll also give names, so it'll be a little bit easier because I won't forget who I've named. Okay, really, we've got different levels of us, which probably will make sense. There's a conscious part. And then those parts of me that are conscious that I'm not necessarily aware of. Sorry, hold on. Sorry about that. I had to do my announcer uh, mute button there. Okay. So this, these two levels, I just call the conscious part, but meaning I'm out in the here and now, but not all of me is aware of who's out in the here and now. Okay. So I will take all of me up here to work. Now, all of me, so that's why I call this co-conscious, meaning 
this my my support team is very much 100% aware of aware of me. They they totally know me. I just don't necessarily know them. But we all go to work. We this is our 7 day a week us. Okay? Now one one truism is this. Every level knows the level above them and all the way up but they don't know the level down. And for each level, they're going to have to go through their own processing. Because for instance, where did I send that one? When we get down to that level, the subconscious part doesn't necessarily know, but they have a sense, just like I don't necessarily know, I mean, oh, you can see the lines of communication there that have to take place. So your homework for anybody that's listening is to begin to risk establishing those lines of communication. Okay. So one, so that means you've had a sense that they are there. These primary support parts have a sense that there's others, but they don't know them. These subconscious parts have a sense that there are others, and those parts, you know, usually, this may or may not be true. We'll kind of, I'll work it through as I go, right? In a way, you know what, once you get to this part, these, uh, the, the repressed parts have a pretty good sense, actually a very good sense, but not all of these will automatically know because not all of these, as far as the repressed parts, will know how many of the wounded parts there are. For this chart, you may want to take a screenshot of this. I added the IFS terms. So just to help you see, now let me bring this back. So IFS will use the term managers right there. Okay. When they use the term managers, that's who they're talking about. So they'll say that actually it'll probably be, they would say that this level I think would be the managers as well. Okay. So anything from here to here in IFS terminology, so the support team and the suppressed parts, those would all fall under the managers, the, the workaday world kind of thing that keeps us going. Okay. The, the middle level is what in IFS terms would be called the firefighters. And the firefighters, this level, what, what I'm calling the repressed parts or the unconscious or amnesic, it's called amnestic, but amnesic roles. So this is what I certainly have forgotten about. Okay. That middle part is to keep this lower part and the upper part from ever meeting. And really what it's doing is this. There are parts of those childlike parts that have the memories that of memories of what, and that's eventually where things are going. Meaning if you experience parts, you experience parts because of trauma. And the trauma came from what? Okay, eventually you're going to have to remember. And there are parts that are willing to give you your memories. It will feel, when that happens, by the way, it'll feel like it's happening. We call those body memories in every activity. But you survived all of this. You just need to know what happened. If you survived it in real time, you can make it through. But you have to risk believing because it's going to feel like, and that's the scary part. I don't want to overwhelm someone. But the reality is it's going to be difficult. And that's why you need to get to know these current day parts. And then eventually you're going to get to know the subconscious parts. You're going to start to get to know them and you're going to start to mediate. And you can see how big your ultimate support team can be. But right here in this red, you see the little red, red dotted line here. Okay, so the repressed parts. IFS calls that the firefighters. Their job, in a way, is to keep things calm so that the top parts can function in daily life. But when 
pain gets too much, and really I think it's this, when either it's been too long keeping a lid on things or when in God's timing you've encountered enough or they're getting too tired to keep a lid on things, then the little parts, we call this one Tina, can now, and IFS uses this term, it's a pretty good term, they call it um, storming the gates. Oh, I'm sorry, wait, I made Tina too big. Hold on, sorry. Okay, let me, let me see, Tina, you're, okay, there we go. So they call it storming the gates and up to the top. And actually in a way, Tina then can, I, I, let me see if I can bring this one forward. So Tina would actually, uh, so there we go. So Tina kind of pulls um, Mary, whoever we're, whatever we're calling the primary person. Um, she would pull her in. So it may sound strange, but somehow Tina would then break through and override. And this would be a dissociative experience. So Tina is going to disclose. This is where the memories start coming back. And then when she is disclosed, you can imagine what's going to happen because Tina got through what? The gatekeeper and radar operator. Okay, the firefighters. And so once, once a memory is disclosed, Mary may or may not hear about it, but if you can also record your, I recommend clients record their sessions. Um, once a memory comes out, then now Mary has a hard time denying. Denial is dropping away. It's falling away. And that's starting to ultimately allow truth to start to come up, right? It's starting to loosen everything. The San Andreas fault is starting to shift. So this is where increased anxiety starts to come up. So it'll start to get difficult. But there are also parts, remember the part that was uh, told, if Tina ever ta talks, we're going to go after little Mary. So as Tina's making a break for it, if she's come to the surface, what's happening to the persecutorial part? Uh, maybe if it was SRA, uh, the perpetrator who became demon-possessed and raped the child uh, called this one um, Apollyon. So you have Apollyon the destroyer. It's actually not Apollyon, but the young part thinks it's Apollyon. Okay? And by the way, inevitably you'll have, just as you have the primary one that was there to take the abuse, and when that one got too, too tired, then the secondary one you can have one that was threatened, a primary one, and then a second one that was threatened. But this one may be biologically or chronologically a little bit older. And then maybe there's an, another primary one. So it could be in a system, and we'll go into this later on. Within this, you have some that are, for lack of better terms, that are related we might even see that this one and this one and this one and this one uh, might be all together and maybe even self-harm. Because if this one, well, they're self-destructive, right? So somehow in part of therapy, what's going to be happening for the therapist and you is eventually you're going to begin to not only get to know who's there, but what their function is and what their role is. And I love it when Frank Anderson says this. This is ultimately where the healing will come in. That if I can risk believing, so up here, if I can risk believing that literally every one of these parts, though right now certain parts hate each other, to be honest, certain parts can't stand each other. Certain parts, here it is, want to kill certain other parts. I, that one didn't work very well, right? Um, but that's because the perpetrator caused certain parts to hate each other. And if you can risk believing, and if I can risk believing, we all can risk believing that ultimately we really, all these parts are here because ultimately they wanted to protect who? The core person. And every single part, regardless of how they feel, really what's under the surface 
is their attempt to protect the core person because none of these parts would be here if they hadn't stepped up and taken the abuse that was being targeted at little Mary. But that's what they don't know yet. They have forgotten that. Or they can't put two and two together yet. And not because they're not stupid, but because the perpetrator was so good at being tricky and manipulative. But the good news is, if I'm talking to the primary person, now I'm talking to the whole system, you guys, the one thing the perps never counted on is you are smarter than them. And you can figure out ultimately how you were lied to. And each of these, especially here we have the trauma bonded one and the obedient one, those tend to gravitate to, and we could even say these were years uh, infancy to, or you know, the baby and toddler years, these are the primary years, or let's say these were age uh, three to five or six, and this is seven to age 12 in here. But the same thing, you're going to see a close relationship in terms of function, duty, duty and the roles they play. So we have here loyal and protector, and here loyal and protector. I tried to kind of color them the same colors. And so these have a lot in common with one another. These have a lot in common with one another. And Oftentimes, if we could group this differently, these would be in their own groupings. And as a matter of fact, let me show you, we'll bring it in for a close, because this shows you the up, down, the levels, the, the layers, and some of their roles. We haven't really gone into the roles yet, okay? But then looking from the top down, so this is kind of looking at the stratification of the different layers. Let me show you how they can be grouped. I'm going to come back out. And is that okay if I show one more here? Okay, I'm, I'm going to. Okay, let me see if, can I turn this one this way? Okay, I was given permission by a client to share this. And here is, there's probably more, but here is kind of a brief example of their rooms, almost like a condominium. Okay, so if you picture this at different levels, but we're looking straight down so we don't get the sense of who's deeper as far as core and who's more surface. What we get is a sense of access and who's connected or related to who, who communicates with who. So she has a primary boardroom. And so what she did is she drew the primary boardroom right here. So the chairman of the board sits here. And then you have a U-shaped boardroom table. So when it's time for therapy, the core person comes in here. And this is where therapy also takes place or a group meetings, okay? Community meetings. So what you see here is kind of the theme of, um, so Max will just go, and you can see that there's some names attached. And she's done a wonderful job in, kind of, there are themes that each person will have. So Max is the one that tries to make sense of things, put things all together. Very logical. Um, Tristan is, I think, very protective of kids. Does a good job. No? I'm embarrassed now. I'll have to go back and ask. But in this picture, what is, uh, so Tristan maybe holds good memories. Okay, there is one that is very artistic. I, I can't read her name, but she loves, oh, oh, I'm sorry. This one is very spiritual. Rodin? I'm sorry, you're supposed to say, John, haven't you looked at this? It's been a while. Um, but I think she actually Amen. changed. Things. All right, so here's the one that would go to church, by the way. You notice back on the other one, I, I don't know if you noticed, I have a spiritual one than an atheist. Why? Because there's parts that ask, you know, if there's a living God, then what's up with us? If there is a God, then he would have, why did he permit that? So I can't believe there's a God. That's very normal and understandable. Okay. Uh, Cheeks is one that loves animals. Okay. So you see, the, so if left up to Cheeks, um, 
guess what the core person might end up finding that they keep purchasing? <laughs> yep, we got we we may have two in a one bedroom apartment. We have we may have two dogs and two cats. <laughs> okay, Libby um, is a child, and you can see little bunny rabbits. So maybe uh, Libby also loves bunny rabbits. Now that's interesting. Charlie, we don't have much description of Charlie, but look at how Charlie is over by himself. And you notice the walkway. So here are means of communication. So Charlie would know Libby pretty well, but Tristan may not have much awareness of um, Charlie. Um, I, Isla, um, she loves plants. So she may keep purchasing plants. Well, what happens if she's on a tight budget and she gets stressed? She still may buy plants because maybe Max was the organized one and kept the budget together. But in times of stress, um, um, Alaya, we'll just call Alaya, sorry. Um, Alaya suddenly comes out and goes on a trip and buys a bunch of plants and blows the budget. And so guess who would be angry? At Alaya, it would be Max. Or maybe Max is frustrated, but maybe Red and Max um, may be some of the key ones. So actually, in this case, I'm familiar with. So Candy, Red, and Max, I guess Alaya would also go to work, but sometimes Alaya is going to blow the budget on plants. And so Red is going to argue and get down on Alaya. Uh, Candy maybe just wants to have fun and check out a little bit. So she's going to allow these two to argue. Um but if Red really gets upset, what might she do? She might rip up the plants. Uh, she might um, even punish, like, you know what? Your hand needs to be smacked with a hammer. So Red might harm, in a way, might harm Alaya. Uh, Rosa looks like a child, so you can see some of these are adults or older, some are small. Who has the musical talent? So when she switches into this, or who is always singing, or when it gets stressful, maybe all of a sudden somebody drowns something out with noise. Uh, but if you were to talk to Max and say, Max, um, after work, we're all going to karaoke, you want to do that? No, it doesn't make sense. I can't sing. But all of a sudden, Tess comes out, <laughs> or maybe Candy says, sure, right before you know it, they're all taking Max, whether Max likes it or not, but Max can go uh, tuck himself in. So Tess goes out and does karaoke, but Max has no interest or has no time. I'll work and no play. Well, Tess is all about play. So we can walk ourselves around. Now, what are we noticing about this side? Now, think of them in terms of little condominiums. So each live in their own little space. And look at communication. So um, we can see that Libby has no direct communication. So the right side of this has no direct communication to the left. Now, what's interesting, who is, I'm having a hard time reading, but the hippie part, I'm supposed to know these names, but I think the person changed them. You can see this one, isn't that interesting? There's no communication, there's no sidewalk. So this one is out just, uh, just tuning out not connected to anybody. So this part uh, could be one that has no relationship with the um, anybody else in the system. And when this one comes out, maybe it's going to get high. Just tunes out, does a bunch of magic mushrooms just because it wants to, right? Now, some may also take magic mushrooms because in order to get some work done, but this one is just to see the colors and tune out. So this one could be irresponsible because it feels no obligation to the effects of what it's going to do. Maybe you're going to get high, go to the go to the bar and pick up somebody. Um, so along with Tess going out and singing karaoke, maybe after a few uh, drinks, what happens? This one comes out and goes to bed with somebody and then causes this entire system because maybe there are some like Rue that doesn't want to be touched. These are the younger ones. So we have Ruth, we have this one with no name, and that's going to be true during your journey as you start to investigate. You're going to have a sense there's a part there that hasn't given you its name yet. This is Mo. Mo's by itself or by himself. 
or herself. And then Harriet, look at what Harriet, this would be one from an SRA perspective, what happened. It took her in tunnels, took her in caves, and she feels like there's what? There's no way out. Rue also feels like no way out and maybe a lot of programming, a lot of very horrible things were done, a lot of repeated things. That repetition can really um, lock things in. Okay, and then TT maybe just has all sorts of negative self-talk, right? It's never going to get any better. It's never going to get better. We can't get rescued. And uh, Mia, I'm not sure about Mia here, but we could say Mia just is in her own little world and I'm not sure what Mia's doing. But you can see that we could kind of hypothesize. But let's say your client or you, so if I'm talking to a therapist, I would say, you know what, have the client draw this. What we would do is we would review this. So the client would tell me about each one. Why? Because I need to get to know each one. Because eventually, I'm going to want to talk to each one. Why? To get to know them, to learn about who they are, their interests, but what are their frustrations? What are their fears? Because maybe, now think about the levels. If we were to turn this, right, we're looking top down, but it might be that these are the childlike ones. They're way down there. And maybe red is a gatekeeper or red is on the medium level. And so we're never going to be able to talk to the young ones unless one kind of breaks free like Tina and all of a sudden says something. But then red might have the ability to take that memory away and hold it for safekeeping. Then red would lecture Tina. So ultimately, unless red is on board, red could have the ability to block entrance or access to these little ones. And so the inner pain would always stay there. And so it's going to be important for the core person. So if you're listening to this, you can begin to see that you're going to have to start with your primary parts, get to know them, and they can give you permission little by little to allow to come up or for you to get to know or allow them to come up in the talking room or the conference room, these other parts. And also, when these little ones do have a chance to say something, um, you can work with Red, you can work with Candy to little by little help them realize that they, Red, Candy, were there to help these little ones as these little ones went through it. So as let's say Harriet is disclosing, Red may have forgotten. But as Harriet discloses, then Red, in a way, will have to go through her own therapy to realize it did happen. So I think probably for tonight, that may be enough. Um, I've given a lot. There's, there's a ton more. This is just a very small percentage of where we're going with all this. So there we go. So Emma, I'll turn it back over to you. This is just, we've just a look at a glance, what an that internal was, world is like. Thank you so much for that. That was so fantastic seeing that art. It's neat seeing how different survivors take these, uh, these systems, these altars, these things that most people don't have any conceptualization of what that could possibly be like. And they're able to draw it. You know, it's really neat. Uh, Carrie Olahe, who you've mentioned that you've seen on my show, you know, she does a beautiful job doing art and, and taking these, you know, really hard situations that most people have a lot of trouble comprehending, you know, and putting it on, on paper for, for not only herself to see and for herself to understand, but for other people, you know, as she's explaining her testimony. So yeah. I think art is so powerful. And I love that that chart that you made too, breaking that down. That's also really fascinating seeing you be able to move those those pieces around and sort of explaining the bigger picture of again something that can be really hard to conceptualize if it's not something you've actually okay. experienced. Emma, you know what? Speaking of art, let me, I think I had mentioned before, but let me take um the audience back to where are we here? I'm going to take us back to, I think, screenshot. Okay, well, let's go back to uh, the website just for a moment because I want to show people. There we go. I'm going back to survivorsupport.net. 
is I want to show people the person that drew the little condominiums is her. So here are two pieces of her artwork. Okay, so the same one that uh, drew Red and Alaya and the little little apartment complex that we just saw, she also drew this, and you can see that she gave me permission. So here is, now you don't see these names. You can see how she, she kind of changed the names on that uh, second chart that we showed with the different walkway and the little condos. Okay, but here's a pretty good description. So there's the rainbow of colors of emotions and how various of her parts have those access to those emotions. And it's also interesting, look at with the, the more, what we would say the negative emotions, and there aren't negative emotions, right? I want people to know that every, every emotion is just as legitimate, but we understand what that, like the anger part, because it's, it's more difficult to experience it. But isn't it interesting that for the most part, we have male names or the more intense kind of emotions. So that's why I am against what's going on in what I call the trans deception. Because during therapy, uh, uh, I'm sorry, well, during therapy, yes, but um, somebody's going through a very difficult time because we'll, I'll just use their names. This would be the darker reds. Um, but let's say Benjamin and Alex and Noah I mean, if you think about a rainbow, this would be the stronger reds. But let's take Alex and Benjamin. Combined, you can imagine the different times that Alex and Benjamin would come out. That would take control. Well, they have enough power combined to shut everybody else down and kind of close the lid. Picture a submarine. It's come to the surface and the hatch is open and you can have one out at a time. But every now and then you might have, but kind of using that analogy. So that's on the surface. Can you imagine if Benjamin or Alex, the submarine comes to the surface and Benjamin says, or Noah, Noah says, I've had it with all of this. He pulls everybody off the submarine. Uh, you know, they've, they've surfaced. Maybe you've had a few, but for purposes of this analogy, he's pulled everybody down and he's got everybody down and he shuts the lid. Now, they could they could submerge it somehow, but let's just pretend, go with this for a second. Let's say they can't take the submarine down. So we have on the submarine, it's on the surface, but he has shut the hatch. So he's kind of in control. And let's say he's they're going through a time where he's so in control that he now, it's like a mutiny. He has now, ta he's taken over. And he's out, he saw a movie and he's, Matt is telling he ain't going to take any, I'm kidding, but they're going through something where now, not just for a day, not for a week, not for a month, maybe a month, but let's say a couple of months, it's only Alex. And Alex is numbing himself now, right? So we actually have, what sex or gender of a client do I have? Right? The client is female. But if Alex is out, when Alex looks in the mirror, what does Alex see? Male. What does Alex feel like? Male. Alex is Alex. Don't try to tell Alex. Now, Alex may interchange the actual name. We'll call her Mary again. But when you say Mary, Alex hears Alex. And Alex is here ultimately to protect. Got to take control of this whole thing because everybody's break. the whole system's breaking down. Because Mary's not getting any damn thing done at work, not getting any, not getting a damn thing right, losing control, acting like a wimp. I got to take over. Okay, now Alex has the strength of a guy. The not the women aren't strength because this is a woman. But as far as what we might say is gender applicable, we've got Alex who has become brash, has become, you know, is just very forthright, almost like a guy that doesn't care. So we have this woman to everybody else. We don't know what the heck happened to Mary. Mary just is like, oh my, Mary scorched her policy. Don't cross Mary at work. She'll give you, right? Mary's changed. <laughs> okay, right? So the outside world's just looking. Mary cut everybody off. Mary told her mother to go to hell in a handbasket. They cut her siblings off, did radical things. 
burned her bra, uh, you know, literally, but not just radical feminism. Now there's one other thing. Alex notices that guys still look at his chest. And Alex doesn't like it. As a matter of fact, Alex doesn't like these flowery things and certainly doesn't like these form-fitting dresses and doesn't like... So Alex is going to solve a problem. And guess what Alex is inclined to do? Alex is going to go to an endocrinologist, then going to go to a surgeon, because Alex wants to pass. But Alex hasn't conferred with how much of her. So Alex will solve the problem of male attention. There, problem solved. Really? Well, what happens after a year? for six months, and the system starts to get too tired, and Alex kind of decides to open up the hatch, and Alex is going to step off the scene. And now Sophia comes back, and she looks at herself in the mirror, and what's happened to her? What did Alex have chopped off? Right? Alex had top surgery, who called that a double mastectomy. Sophia liked being a girl, liked being a woman. As a matter of fact, Emily and Liz and Isabella and Liam, I think that's a female name, though, uh, Sophia, uh, Grace, they all liked being a woman. And they wake up one day and find that now they've added insult to injury or injury to insult, and some doctor went along with it. Because the doctor saw, because doctors are smart, the doctor is trained as a mandated reporter, and they're trained to know the symptoms of child abuse and sexual abuse. And there are nine primary indicators. And quite frankly, Mary had all of them. Why didn't the doctor tell Alex, but tell Mary, you know what? How about we hold off on this? And how about you try therapy first? Why within two weeks did they get Mary an insurance permission or insurance permission to pay for the double mastectomy? Because the surgeons are diabolically unethical and greedy. That did not help Mary. All it did is remove Mary's breasts and leave her now scarred and troubled and separated from herself, and the trauma is still inside. You never help anyone by removing body parts because no body part is going to help the pain. That's why I'm so against it. It's very, very sad. So if anybody is aware of, that's why I do unmasking the trans movement. No one needs to do surgery. It used to be in psychology that the goal was to help a client in terms of self-esteem, help them accept themselves. Well, how do you do that? Well, if it's trauma therapy, you got to go through the, the healing process. But to come to accept yourself, you have to, you have to feel good about yourself. And how do you do that? Ultimately, it's through competence. You find out what you're good at, you find out your purpose, and you move towards that. And then you will find that you have a sense of purpose and you feel good, you see accomplishment, you see success, and that's where true self-esteem comes from. But if you tell someone the way to accept yourself is to eradicate yourself, chop this part off first and this part off first, bind this, you know, and, and by the way, perpetrators want their victims to look as young as possible and never have a chance of getting pregnant. That's what puberty blockers do. And then cross-sex hormones continues that process. They sterilize somebody, and now you have messed them up. They were already troubled, and they, have, they don't have the one thing, and they'll never be able to bring it back until they go through the healing process. They don't have their intuition. 
So the answer to the trans deception is allow kids to get their intuition back that facilitates healing, that will help them with their boundaries, that will keep them from being perped on and exploited. So never medicalize yourself. You don't need to because that's not going to touch the inner core of what's going on. So take the entire trans, you're not trans, okay? When we look at Mary's picture, let me go back in closing. Okay? Mary is not trans. Trans, the term never it was never used prior to 2005. It didn't exist. Mary has lots of parts of her that some identify as male, some identify as female. Well, that's fine. But then don't have somebody come from the outside and convince her what she needs to do is get on the moving sidewalk of medicalization, which eventually will um, sterilize her. And it leads to 100%. If you follow the trans deception out to its logical conclusion, it's a moving sidewalk. It's not static. It's social transition, then it's medicalization, and then drops you out onto a surgeon's gurney where they will amputate you. Somebody's getting rich off of you and leaving you scarred and the pain untouched. And now you have to maintain this artificial state through pharmaceuticals the rest of your life. It shows you it's not natural. You're not born in the wrong body. Your body is exactly you. Begin the process of healing so that you can realize that you're in the right body that you should have been and that the healing needs to take place on the inside. It's much cheaper. You won't have to buy pharmaceuticals. You won't have to be sticking yourself with needles. You won't have to be ruining um, all sorts of things. You won't have to be risking with these pharmaceuticals. You won't be a, a medication patient for life. And then you can begin to focus on the real healing to begin to accept every part of you and then work on the trauma, where the trauma came from. Great words to close with, John. So much hope that you give to people on the other side who are struggling. And I really appreciate you, all the thought that you put into these presentations and your answers and all the research that you've done over all these decades and just your your curiosity and passion for continually growing, despite if it conflicts what you spent, you know, all that money for in school, you know, to learn. I love people that aren't afraid to say, well, what if there was more information or could this have maybe been wrong or I just wasn't fully informed, you know, and it's awesome to see somebody like you being okay with questioning that and then getting those answers and expanding your education and not feeling, you know, boxed in. So we all appreciate the work that you do as survivors and everything that you do for free for us and that you're coming on here and doing this series. And I'm sure everybody listening is excited that you'll have books that they can now read and, and you know, pass on to people who might not listen to a podcast. So just thank you so much for all your work, John. And I'm going to have all of John links below in the show notes, you guys. He has two YouTube channels. He's constantly posting content on his blog is constantly expanding. His website is a fantastic resource, all of his websites, you know, so go dive into all of that. Like I said, research up whether you're in therapy or not. It's it's free stuff that you guys can learn from. It's, it's personal development. So go dive into it, support him, get your eyes on him, share his content. And uh, all my links also will be in the show notes. So connect with me too. connect with us on all platforms. Um, we never know, like how John was saying, we never know where we're going to be today and, you know, who might kick us off tomorrow. So just try to connect with all with us on all platforms if you guys can. We can't do this without you guys. God bless you and we will see you next time.